if there is one person in the field of surgery, especially GI surgery, who is synonymous with pedagogy and teaching students in India, it is Dr. V.K. Kapoor. I have such immense respect for him and it is an enormous privilege today that I could uh, uh, get hold of him in a, in a liver meeting and bring him uh, to this uh, audience and uh, welcome sir. Thank you. I do not know how many of you know that never a day goes in uh, Dr. Kapoor's life when he is not taught something to someone, you know, I mean that is uh, part of his genetic makeup and I often wonder why he is always in the mood of giving, giving knowledge to people. Actually, a number of times he does it forcibly, you know, <laughs> he sort of beg to, you know, students to take and that particular uh, uh, trait have not seen anyone. Sir, uh, um, we just want to know, actually, uh, we want to know how, uh, you know, when, whenever uh, I come across legends like this, I keep wondering how these legends are made, what is what is that they are made of and actually how did they evolve, why, why does not uh, uh, every surgical teacher like him. So, uh, before that sir, I, I just want to know about your childhood and what atmosphere you grew up and whether that has anything to do with uh, your future career. Thank you, Pata. Thank you. I, I hope I can address you as Pata rather than saying Dr. Radhakrishna <laughs> uh, for uh, getting me on this uh, platform, which I am sure is one of the largest not only in the country but anywhere in the world for uh, online education of uh, surgical students as well as practicing surgeons. I think you did mention that. Uh, uh, teaching uh, is in my genetic makeup. I think you you are right. Uh, I most probably got it uh, from my grandfather, who was a teacher. He was a school principal. Uh, not a very highly educated person as we see today, uh, but a very intelligent uh, person. Uh, a perfect English grammar uh, teacher. I learnt on my English from him. So, I, I think I have got these genes from him. Uh, I belong to a, a family uh, from West UP. Uh, as I said, my grandfather was a teacher, my father was a government servant in uh, UP government. So, we kept moving from one place to another. Uh, we never stayed for more than three years at a place. I got my schooling at different schools in uh, UP. but. I would probably give uh, credit to one school where I went on a government uh, scholarship uh, which is in Varanasi, uh, Rajghat Basin School. This school was started by Annie Basent and uh, then it was uh, kind of uh, adopted by Jiddu Krishnamurti. It became Krishnamurti Foundation of India uh, institution and I spent three years there. Uh, and the teachers there laid the foundation of my further uh, education. And then uh, I would say the All India Institute of Medical Sciences where I did my… Before we go to the All India Medical Sciences, how uh, were you in school, you are a very obedient student or you are the topper or what was the atmosphere? Because I see the Krishnamurti Foundation does not have any competitive, uh, they do not bother about marks, they want to have overall development of a student, that is their policy. Uh, how was it? Because uh, um, many, many people from this foundation became musicians and uh, uh, they, they are not that academically inclined, but how was that you are different? Yeah, I, <laughs> I have been a very serious, very disciplined and uh, as you uh, asked that uh, most of the classes I would be in the top 10, top 5, top 3. Uh, I did not spend, I would not say waste, but I did not spend much time in sports or extracurricular activities. So, I was a very studious child uh, to begin with. And um, somehow I had this uh, uh, habit which I feel um, all students, I do not know whether it is possible to develop because it probably gets, uh, you get it in your uh, genes or your upbringing, um, what is known as a uh, scanning reading that you scan a page and pick up the important points, so that saves time. 
and fortunately I had a very good memory. So I remember in uh, I think it was class 8 that I would uh, I could recite the entire physics book from A to Z to my fellow students <laughs> once I have read it. So these two things probably helped me to remain at the top in studies although I did very poorly in sports. Uh, I did try my hands at extracurricular activities a little bit but uh, primarily I was a studious child. Then how did you get into medicine? How did yeah. you get that idea? So when I finished my 10th uh, in uh, uh, this uh, Rajghat Basin School, uh, for some reasons my favorite subject was geography. But obviously I belong to a low middle class family so every parent wanted the child to be a doctor or engineer and uh, my school teacher there, the, my favorite school teacher uh, Mr. Naveen Tandon, <coughs> he is still alive and very active. Uh, he, uh, uh, when my father came uh, to finally take me from the residential school, this was a residential school, three okay. years. Mm -hmm. So, um, he, my parents came once to drop me and then to take me back after three years. So, uh, Mr. Tandon told uh, my father, no, 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 biology because he was the biology teacher. So, that is how I took, bi uh, those days we never had the option of taking both medicine, uh, I mean maths and biology together. You had to choose one subject in class 11. So I took uh, biology and that is how I got into medicine. Mm. And how did you get into the All Indian Medical Sciences? Uh, that also is a very interesting uh, story because uh, since I was from UP and Ames was in Delhi and we were uh, from a low or uh, middle, middle income family, we never thought I had heard the name of Ames when I was preparing but uh, it never even crossed my imagination that I could opt for it. So I did not even get the form. I got the form only for uh, UP uh, pre-medical test and a uh, few others including AFMC uh, but not Ames. So I think it was last week of February. Uh, one of my classmates, uh, I belong to a city called Saharanpur, so that is where I did my class 12. Uh, we, uh, we were in a group and he was just mentioning that I have got the form but I am not applying. So he asked me, do you want to take the form? It is for free. I said, okay, if you are giving it, it is fine. So that is how I got the form, filled it and uh, I, I would say that I still remember those days was not MCQ days. We used to get short uh, questions. So, there were uh, I think 10 short questions or something and there were two questions, one on Nicole prism because physics used to be the, the differentiating feature. Yes. Chemistry and biology everybody will do well. Yeah. Somebody who does well in physics would probably get the rank. Okay. So, in the physics paper we had two questions, Nicole prism and electron microscope and somehow I had read those two questions just a few days ago. and. I knew everything as I said from A to Z, so probably those two questions got me into the AIMS. So, but you are uh, from in a smaller city or some sort of a semi-urban to, to uh, real urban and uh, that too you know you have uh, students from all over, was not it a cultural shock, it took a while for you to adjust to the atmosphere there? Uh, uh, I was familiar with Delhi because my mother's uh, uh, family is from Delhi. So, my um, uncles and aunts, we used to go to Delhi to my mother's parents and mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. Uh, but uh, yes, Ames was intimidating because I came from a small city. And actually, uh, uh, before that, I had joined AFMC huh. because AFMC result used to be announced the first. Okay. So, as soon as AFMC result was announced, Obviously, you are getting into a medical school, you cannot say no waiting for other, although I was almost certain that I would get into UP uh, medical college, but uh, we could not take the risk, parents also did not want to take a risk. So, they shunted me off to Pune and I joined there, got my head shaved, got ragged for 15 days <laughs> and then the, the AIMS result came that also was very uh, uh, same way like I applied for uh, AIMS. Uh, we were all first year students in AFMC spending our time, studies had not started. Uh, so, somebody said AIMS result has been announced and it is there in the newspaper which is parents must have informed him from Delhi. Uh, so, he said 
the first number is 47. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, not rank wise, it used to be number wise and the next is 900, uh, 900 something and mine is 500. So, in between there is no other. So, I said, what is the first number you said? He said 47. I said, that is my roll number. <laughs> So then, uh, I mean, those were the days when they were I mean, going to the No, no, it, it was not <coughs> in uh, order right, of right, merit. Right. It was increasing oh, in ascending right, order. Right, so, right, first right. roll number, then next. Mm. So, uh, there were no mobiles, there were no emails, nothing. Um, one of my distant relatives, my grand uncle, he was in armed forces. Uh, he was posted in Kharki near Pune. So, then I went to his home. He called uh, Delhi and he found out the formal result and then uh, the parental pressure started, no, no, you can't go into army and uh, you have to come back and obviously Pune was far off from where we, yeah. my parents were staying. So, then I came back to Ames. So, you asked about Ames. Yes, Ames was intimidating. We were very few. Uh, we used to have 50 people in one batch. Uh, out of that, uh, five were foreign students, so we were 45. Out of that, uh, a much smaller number came from the socio-economic background to which I belong. Most of my classmates were from Delhi, from uh, convent schools and uh, um, fluently speaking English and uh, from a little higher uh, socio-economic status than us. Uh, so, it was a little intimidating, but uh, Somehow again, um, during the ragging, we used to have ragging those days, so mm. the, today it is illegal. Uh, during the ragging time, my immediate seniors, they told me, do not waste your time, start reading from day one, because sooner than you realize, you will have the first mid-semester exam right. at, after two months. The AIM session started on 1st August, last week of September were the exam. So, they had prepared me well, they gave me notes, they gave me books and all. And uh, it so happened that the first result which was announced was of, uh, we used to have spotting in microanatomy where slides were shown and all and uh, that was 15 marks. So, I got 13.5, only one out of uh, uh, 10 spots I did wrong and probably very few other people got uh, that. So, that gave me a lot of confidence and then <laughs> of course, the story started. So, uh, what was your, uh, who inspired you? Uh, for uh, you know uh, focusing on uh, um, reading and uh, doing well in uh, because uh, many a times when you have this issue of uh, um, uh, you, uh, you, you the initial mbbs is people tend to get some sort of a low self esteem when you compare to others you see somebody speaking good english somebody is from you know topper in a big school how could you get over it because uh, people go through that uh, yeah. trough I think this exam played an important role because that showed to me that I can also stand at the same level as uh, my classmates and uh, I, as I said, I was studious but this gave me confidence and uh, then of course, there was no going back. So, what, what subjects did you like in MBBS? Again, uh, in, in Ames, the, the undergraduate hostels were mixed. So, uh, first year uh, and in the same wing, there were nine rooms. Uh, we had a senior colleague who was doing house job in anatomy because he had not still got a room in Arshivanandan, Dr. Arshivanandan was his name in the PG hostel. So, he used to call me to his room and teach me anatomy when I was in the first MBBS. So, I liked anatomy and probably that uh, sowed the seeds or laid the foundations for surgery becoming my choice uh, later. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did your general surgery also in Ames. Yes. Uh, how did you uh, a transition from internship to, was it easy to get into MS general surgery or did you have uh, any other uh, non-PG junior residency or anything of that nature before you got into surgery? No, we used to have uh, the three year uh, MS program by that time because the residency scheme was already in place and it used to be an entrance exam and as I said, by the time I reached final MBBS in internship, I had decided that I am going to do surgery. There was no other. No, no, who inspired you? Because it's usually mm -hmm. in your internship, we will find one famous surgeon, you know, you in the, the way the, the surgeon talks, the way he walks and somebody, you know, what I in, uh, incited you to take up surgery is a... I 
think I had almost decided on surgery during first or second MBBS only. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, why that, sir? Because you say people who want to take up surgery are not so smart. Uh, you know, they're not very good in reading, uh, and they're scared of medicine. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> at that time, medicine was number one. Pediatrics was number two. Surgery came very low down. So in fact, it was it became a disadvantage to me also because I knew that I am going to do surgery. So in the third professional, I became very lax in studying and I my rank <laughs> fell down significantly. And I paid very little attention to medicine and gynae because I knew that I am going to do surgery. Uh, so I don't think at that time, but yes, I should mention one of my surgical uh, faculty, Dr. N. C. Madan. He was a uh, plastic uh, surgeon and I liked him because I developed a very small problem and in growing toenail as a medical student and he himself operated upon me uh, a minor procedure in the minor routine local anesthesia and he was an I think an associate professor at that time and uh, that that uh, created an impact on my mind but as I said I had almost decided that uh, I'm going to do surgery as a surgical trainee, how was your life? Because a lot of uh, postgraduate trainees uh, do not know what should be the routine to become a good surgeon, that how much time I should spend in the wards, how much should I read and how will I learn operative surgery, my surgical chances aren't good enough and you know they are all in a confusion. You would have understood that in the recent uh, last one year, the craze for surgery has Gone fallen down. down like anything. In Chennai, uh, for the first hundred, only two operated yes. vaginal surgery. Yes, I saw those reports in the social media. Yeah, so in, in our days and I would say even almost 15, 20 years ago, uh, any residency was heavy, but surgery definitely was heavy and uh, uh, I do not think there were any working hours. I do not think there was any time to do anything else. It, it was surgery and surgery alone except when you are sleeping. That also if you are on call, if there is an emergency. So, uh, for example, you would come to the ward at 7, 7.30, prepare for the morning session, teaching round, the rounds and then you go to wherever you are posted. If you are on duty on that day, then obviously whole night uh, you are busy seeing patients in the ward, emergencies, operations, consultations and it is not that next day you are not there. Next day again, 7, 7.30 you are there. So, in between you have to do find time to maybe have a little bit of sleep, maybe uh, wash yourself, change yourself and uh, have a breakfast and all. So, it is surgery residency those days meant surgery only. You are living surgery, you are eating. I, you are mentally prepared for it or you thought this too much of burden, why I landed in surgery? No, I, I never felt that way. In fact, I enjoyed uh, because uh, probably I was mentally prepared. Uh, I do not think we ever felt any one of us, not only me, but any one of us, my, my other uh, colleagues who joined in the same batch or my immediate seniors or uh, younger people, I do not think any one of us regretted uh, joining surgery, probably because we had joined by choice and uh, during the internship we had observed our uh, uh, seniors uh, doing that. So, uh, I would say it, it, it was a joyous journey uh, in addition to learning also. And even as senior resident, uh, because then in addition to workload, you have responsibility also. Because senior resident is the person who runs the unit. Consultants are there, but they are not there all the time. Your younger colleagues, the junior residents are there, but they are still not mature enough. So, you have to keep a watch on them, you have to guide them, you have to educate them. So, even senior residency was quite, uh, uh, I would not say taxing, it was tough, but uh, I think we all enjoyed it. Which, uh, since you raised this point, I find it little uh, discomforting and I am little unhappy that these days uh, re residents probably feel that they do not want to s give the whole to the speciality. Uh, from their point of view, it may be right also because we did it at the sacrifice of our personal family, even after you get married, you give very little time to your spouse, your children if they are there. Um, we hardly gave any time to our parents. So, uh, one may say that it was not the right thing to do, but uh, I would say uh, it was. No, but if you have to do it all over again, you will do the I same will, or will. maybe more. No, I will do the same. Only, only regret, 
uh, sometimes you feel once your parents are gone that you haven't done enough yeah. for them now uh, which unit were you in you was your chief a very famous person yes. your assistants yeah. were very good yeah. Dr. I fortunately joined Dr. Atam Prakash's unit. He was the chief of surgery, very uh, charismatic person. Uh, uh, he had a big name in the national and I am sure international. Unfortunately, he passed away very early. He was uh, to organize, uh, in fact, he pa uh, passed away during that meeting. He was the pres organizing president of the International College of Surgeons meeting, which was being held in uh, Delhi. And then uh, from him, uh, Dr. L. K. Sharma took over. He was a he is a very gentle personality, and like his personality, he was very gentle to the tissues also. So tissue handling, I learned from him. No, but uh, was there any favoritism in the unit? Is it that? Uh, the chiefs used to like somebody who is very hard working, sincere, honest or somebody who is you know, um, yeah, is some sort of psychophant. Uh, I mean like in any other group uh, you would have different kind of people, so uh, residents also were of different kinds, but I do not think uh, that uh, we saw, uh, I, I can tell you that. Uh, during those days as a junior and a senior resident, I was very active in the students union and the resident doctors association and uh, we had strikes also. We had demonstrations uh, on the campus and all, uh, but uh, I do not think it ever affected uh, my uh, posting or education or training or exam or my placement in any way. So, that way I think I have to give credit to teachers not only in surgery, but in other departments also in AIMS and the senior people who were in administration that they kept the two things separate. As long as we did what uh, was allowed and permissible, we did not break the law. Uh, it never affected our uh, either training or uh, promotion in any way. So, I do not think. Uh, uh, any one of us. Uh, but definitely that, uh, sincerity and honesty is rewarded. E that even today, I am sure even today all teachers and trainers uh, in any department uh, would uh, recognize who is sincere, who is hard working, who is honest, who is uh, conscientious and uh, if not immediately in the long run it will. So, uh, when I became a teacher myself, a trainer myself, the only thing I would tell my students when they would finish and go either to another institution or on their own, I said that you just have to wait for some time, uh, do your work sincerely, ethically, conscious, conscientiously and if not sooner, little later your uh, efforts will be rewarded. So, I, I think those qualities are still valuable, they are still essential at least in our profession. So, regarding operative surgery, did you have any methodology by which you learn the maximum? What are those little things which you did? So, again I was very fortunate because in the unit we had two consultants, Dr. Lalit Sharma as I said, very gentle, very conservative, very safe surgeon. On the other hand, I had Dr. T. K. Chattopadhyay, the, the prominent, uh, one of the most eminent, prominent esophageal surgeons of the country, very aggressive, uh, uh, I would not say rough, but very aggressive surgeon and uh, so we had these two extremes and uh, we used to talk that uh, in uh, being a senior resident in that unit is like uh, 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 crossing a river with your one foot in one boat and other in the <laughs> other boat and the two are moving towards. So, uh, it, it became an advantage for us. We learnt how to be gentle to the tissues also, how to be gentle, uh, uh, be conservative so that you do not go beyond your limits and on the other hand we learnt how to do 
try to do little more than what you can be doing and, and uh, do more. So, Dr. Chattopadhyay was the one who introduced esophageal surgery and followed uh, Dr. Nandi's uh, footsteps in portal hypertension surgery and all major uh, surgical procedures. So, that way I think it was an advantage for us who were in that unit and uh, some of the other, I have to mention uh, the, the colleagues from that unit uh, um, other than me. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Ardhanari mm. uh, is a product of the same unit. Dr. Arvind Kumar, who is a very famous robotic uh, surgeon in Delhi. Dr. Sadik Sikora, Dr. Subhash Gupta, Dr. Soyan. So, they are all products of the same unit. Oh, really? And I think we had this advantage that we saw both the approaches to uh, surgery. Now, uh, you lay a lot of emphasis on the basic science. Now, where did you get uh, that edge? Because uh, you simplify surgery, understanding surgery and I think to teach uh, a student in this is so much necessary. Was it uh, you gathered it along the uh, uh, your course or you got it in AIMS itself, that understanding? Yeah, as I said that I used to like anatomy and uh, so that probably forms the basis of surgery. Next important thing for any surgeon is to understand pathology. So, anybody who wants to do surgery or who is doing surgery should revisit these two subjects, anatomy and uh, pathology. Uh, the other is if you are referring to my interest in uh, basic scientific research that um, um, during our training we did not have much exposure to uh, other than clinical uh, research. Um, all the publications in my early career are basically data based publications uh, both in AIMS and then in SCPGI. But uh, the person who introduced me to basic research in SCPGI was my senior colleague in medical genetics, a basic scientist Dr. Suraksha Agrawal. She pushed me into uh, research especially in relation to gallbladder cancer which then became my primary area of interest and uh, gradually I learnt at least the ABC of uh, uh, basic research from her. So, in the Alnay Institute, as you are uh, finishing your senior, you did three years registrarship as well. Yes. Now, when you are finishing that, did you focus yourself in any particular area? Because uh, these days, everybody is super specialty oriented. When the general surgery itself, they will start reading for the specialty. What, what was it uh, or who prompted you in a particular direction? What is the specialty you choose? So, in AIMS, uh, we had four units in uh, general surgery. At that time, there was no separate department of uh, surgical gastroenterology. To some extent, some units did certain areas little more than the others. For example, there was a unit in which uh, Dr. Dhawan, uh, who is no more, and Dr. Madan, whom I mentioned earlier, they were basically plastic surgeons and they used to do renal transplant also. So, that unit uh, concentrated more on plastic and uh, transplant. Then Dr. B. M. L. Kapoor, uh, the doyen of uh, GI surgery and Dr. Nandi were in one unit. So, that unit concentrated more on GI. Uh, then there was a unit in which Dr. M. M. Kapoor was there. He uh, used to uh, have special interest in endocrine surgery. He is the one who developed endocrine surgery. And in our unit, Dr. Sharma, who was a pure true general surgeon who would do everything and Dr. Chattopadhyay who did more of GI work. So, I think it is from Dr. Chattopadhyay that I got the interest in uh, GI and uh, because of uh, him also uh, and we had uh, good data even at that time I remember that all discharge summaries, all operation notes, all histopathology reports uh, we would uh, collect them, print it and get them bound and they are all still there in the departmental library, uh, this I am talking of 19, early 1980s. So, uh, uh, that uh, gave us a lot of publications and fortunately, my initial publications, although from a general surgical unit, were related to GI. So, uh, why did not you continue in all names suit as faculty? <laughs> I did want to, but uh, at that time the institute did not uh, consider me suitable. So, uh, the SCPGI was coming up. Uh, I remember uh, Dr. B. M. L. Kapoor uh, told some of us that this new institute is coming up, why do not you people apply? So, I applied. Uh, once I was selected, but there was some administrative tangle, so appointment letters were not issued. 
then I appeared again and next time I got So, was that general surgery or was this No, no, uh, SGPGI uh, was a unique institution. It, it started even a step above uh, PGI Chandigarh. The, uh, the uh, founding fathers of SGPGI decided that the institute will have only five super specialties. Uh, cardiology, I mean cardiac, neuro, renal, endocrine and gastroenterology. So, it was a surgical gastroenterology post and I became a surgical gastroenterologist, I became a teacher of surgical gastroenterology without myself having any qualification in surgical gastroenterology because at that time the only center which mm -hmm. was offering MCH was uh, Madras Medical College under the uh, headship of Dr. Uh, Rangabhashyam, but I suppose at that time it was mainly for, uh, Only for local uh, right. students. So, uh, uh, the initial uh, GI surgery teachers, we were all uh, self-styled uh, GI surgeons. So, you knew pretty well that this is a GI surgical unit you are going to? Yes, yes. And that was, uh, who is the professor? No, so initially when SGPGI started, this is in 1989, so two of us, myself and my colleague Dr. Rajan Saxena who came from PGI Chandigarh, so two of us joined as assistant professors and we started the department and then after about two years in October 1990, Dr. Kaushik, uh, late Dr. Kaushik, he moved from Chandigarh because he also had special interest in GI, but Chandigarh for various reasons could not establish a department of GI surgery. So, he joined as professor and he was the founder, uh, professor and head and uh, we were very fortunate to have his presence uh, because he uh, gave us the protection of a senior and he gave us the freedom to do whatever we wanted to do. So, we had best of both the worlds and uh, that is how I feel I grew. I also have to mention. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Subhash Nayak, he was a medical gastroenterologist, he was the chief of medical gastroenterology, but uh, before Dr. Kaushik came, he acted as my mentor in that institution and uh, even later, uh, he got me involved in so many academic and other activities which uh, probably were useful to me much later. So, when you joined uh, SGPJ, you have a general surgical mindset. Uh, you know, there are many, many patients who will cover general surgical problems which you refuse to treat. Yeah, we, we, we would never. Uh, I think in an year, even at that time, we would not do more than five, uh, say, hernias, uh, which also were main, mainly for social, somebody's, like your colleague's relative. Who set the rules? Uh, the founding fathers of the institute. Uh, Founding father must be a gastroenterologist surgeon. No, this was for all specialties. Okay. So, there was no internal medicine, there was no general surgery, there is no pediatrics. Why that? I think it actually when SCPGI was conceptualized, it was thought of as a uh, separate building or institution in the campus of the pre-existing King George's Medical College, which is a very reputed institution. And because it had all the general uh, specialities, uh, that is what they must have thought. But later, for various reasons and I think for good reasons, it was decided that no, it will be a separate, geographically distinct, uh, independent entity. And uh, the initial equipment, uh, the, uh, which is still there in SGBGI, all came un as a gift from the Japanese government under the JICA scheme. Japanese international uh, collaborating agency. So, uh, I think it was a good decision. There were few disadvantages of not having these basic uh, subjects, but it gave us time uh, to concentrate on the speciality. And as I said, we would never do uh, a pure general surgical procedure uh, like breast, thyroid or anything. Few hernias or incisional hernias, which could uh, fall in our domain, but that also not for uh, general patients, uh, your colleague's father or uh, somebody known, uh, but not more than 5 or 10 cases in any year. So, it was pure GI. The, the, uh, I would always say that the minimum, uh, I would not say the smallest, but the minimum procedure that was done in that unit and is still being done in that unit is cholecystectomy. Now, I often wonder, uh, of course, Delhi being the capital games, I don't know why, how Chandigarh got PGI 
and why Lucknow of all the places got SGPJ? Why not Kolkata? Why yeah. not Bhubaneswar? Why not Bhopal? What what is special? We all those things that <laughs> the, the areas are very poorly educated. Yes. Areas. Yeah, so that, that's a political reason. I think uh, that time uh, late Mr. Rajiv Gandhi was the Prime Minister, so he went to Japan and uh, Mr. Kamlapati Tripathi and his son Mr. Lokpati Tripathi, I think Mr. Lokpati Tripathi was the Health Minister of UP. He was a part of the contingent and when the Japanese government offered to give this grant, a huge grant at that time to establish a new institution, it must be that reason why UP got it. Uh, many of us when we joined, uh, I think I joined it because I was getting a job, number one. Number two, without a qualification, I was being promoted from general surgery to GI surgery becoming a specialist. Uh, and we never thought that this institute will do so well being in UP uh, because earlier experiment in Patna had uh, failed miserably the Indira Gandhi Institute unfortunately and we thought that this institute also has no future but at least I am getting a job, I am getting the tag of a super specialist and I probably I had in my mind that okay after some time I will go back to AIMS or PGI or some other reputed institution but once we settled there in the first uh, maybe couple of years we realized that this institute has potential and the the working environment for young faculty was to some extent even better than what I had seen uh, in AIMS and what I had heard about PGI Chandigarh because in AIMS after finishing my senior residency, I worked as a consultant on an ad hoc position for some time, me and Dr. Arvind both uh, together. So, the, the amount of uh, professional independence and freedom to do things which we felt in this institute even after Dr. Kaushik came and we were very fortunate that a person like him came who had a very open, very liberal mind towards uh, younger colleagues uh, that we decided that uh, no, this is the place. Uh, is it got something to do with the government, the local government or the directors of uh, the or the factory? Yeah. I would say uh, the, the biggest credit goes to the first uh, director, uh, medical director, Dr. B.B. Sethi. He was a psychiatrist from KGMC, uh, well known person in his field. Uh, but he, in spite of being from UP, in spite of being from KGMC, he had a very broad vision. And he was the person who wanted to establish this institute different from what existed in UP at that time, number one. Number two, I think the initial senior faculty who came and I mentioned the name of Dr. Nayak who left a job in KEM hospital and came there. Then we have the urologist Dr. Bhandari, Dr. Mahendra Bhandari who went on to become the director also. He came from Jipmer Pondicherry and Dr. Kaushik came from Chandigarh. Uh, we had Dr. Ayagiri and Mrs. Ayagiri who came from Chandigarh. So, the initial lot of and even the people who came from KGMC, they left their flourishing practice, Dr. S. S. Agrawal, Dr. D. K. Chhabla and uh, a few others and they gave full 24-7 to this institute which was till that time not a known phenomenon in UP. Nobody in UP could imagine that a doctor in a medical college would not do practice. Initially, actually, we used to get patients who would ask, uh, Dr. Sab, Sham, uh, when in the evening can we consult you? Where is your clinic? And they would, and I remember that as a young faculty member, because there were very few residents, sometimes I would go and remove the sutures or do the dressing, and then the patient's relative will take out a 100 rupee note and try to give to me, because that is what they have seen. So, nobody could imagine, and I am very happy that that practice, that trend is continuing even now. I do not think any finger has ever been raised against a faculty member in SGPGI for doing private work. I mean, what made all the, the, uh, the cream de la cream from all big institutions come to um, SGPGI? Uh, the Lucknow is not a great city as compared to Delhi, Mumbai and so on and uh, your children also did not get any special MBBS or PG seats. What made you, was the money more or the comfort more, was, what is it? No, money was same uh, as AIMS or PGI Chandigarh because uh, it was decided that the 
salary structure and perks of the faculty will be same as AIMS and uh, PGI. There was nothing extra. Uh, obviously, uh, if you compare it with the teachers in the medical colleges uh, in the state of UP, the salary was more, but the earning was less because there was no private uh, practice right. uh, allowed and done also. At many places, it is not allowed, but it is done. So, I suppose uh, uh, it was mainly the professional reason for which uh, the initial people came because they saw an opportunity to create something, to develop something. It was a new institution. And then, of course, once it uh, got rooted well, uh, then uh, the second generation came attracted by the uh, reputation of the institute. I remember in the initial years when we would go and tell people that I am now working in SGPGI, people would ask, uh, where is SGPGI, what is SGPGI? And then over a period of time, it changed to a wow kind of response. Oh, you are in SGPGI. So, and it happened in a short span of time. How did it happen? I think it is it's a mix. I would say that uh, fortunately, uh, the, the government except for one or two years in between, we never had any fund crunch. So, finances were provided by the government. There was, at least in the beginning, uh, there was very little interference in day-to-day -day activity. The directors had a uh, lot of uh, autonomy and uh, independence and they could take decisions. Uh, no politician was directly involved in the administration because the president of the governing body of the institute was the chief secretary, never the health minister, never any politician. And the dedication of the faculty, because as I said, there are so many other institutions where practice is not allowed, but it is done. Uh, but I do not think ever we had any doubt that any faculty member in SGPGI is doing outside uh, uh, work for extra money. And uh, then, of course, we started attracting good students. In most departments, after I think initial 5 or 10 years, students started coming from all over the country. And uh, best of the, in fact, in many specialities, including ours, uh, we uh, for many years ranked as number one choice of the students. Uh, who would like to join. So, I think it is a combination of uh, factors and now it is basically on an autopilot mode. It has established its place uh, as one of the top institutions in the country, both for patient care and for uh, more I would say for training, uh, because uh, um, at least I can talk of uh, surgical gastroenterology. I think 99 percent of our trainees, whether they were MCH or even non-MCH senior residents, they are doing hardcore and good quality GI surgical work rather than going back to general surgery. Almost all the students that came out of your department while you are there fondly remember you <laughs> um, and they do not mention any other name. I mean, what is so special that uh, you did for them that they remember you so much? No, no, I think it is the entire department which uh, uh, contributed to the uh, teaching and training and we all had the same uh, work ethos, the same working principle. Uh, uh, we all always taught them to do ethical practice and of course, uh, uh, the workload was much. Uh, GI as it is a very heavy specialty, so many complications, so many sick patients. So, uh, barring maybe one or two, uh, they can be counted on the fingers of a uh, single hand. Uh, almost all of our residents were very, very sincere, very hard working. Um, sometimes I say that they were within inverted comma like bonded labors, no work hours, no uh, extra work, but uh, you can do, uh, ask them to do whatever they want to do, uh, you want them to do. So, um, uh, why they probably would remember me, I, I, as I, as you have said in the first uh, sentence that I always enjoy uh, teaching. So, any opportunity whether a resident is presenting a patient in the OPD or in the ward, even if it is a working ground or in the theater when I am assisting them or I am observing them or they are assisting me. And sometimes even now on WhatsApp and email also when they report about a patient, I would always add a small 
tip uh, for them uh, for future. So probably that's the reason why they would remember me. And that is how I want to be remembered after I am gone also. How long have you been there in uh, SGPG? 32 years. 32 long years? Yes. <laughs> so 15 years in uh, AIMS and uh, 32 years in SGPGI and now rest of the life in uh, Jaipur. As I uh, said when I joined uh, Jaipur, I think we will come to that later, but uh, I call AIMS as my Janma Bhumi, the place of my birth, professional birth. Uh, SGPGI was my Karm Bhumi, where I did whatever I did. And now Jaipur, I say, is the Tapo Bhumi where I want to devote and give whatever I have got and learnt. So the digestive disease week is your uh, brain child? The SG week in SGPGI? Yeah. No, it was Dr. Kaushik's. Right. When he came, uh, the first thing he said that we should have uh, an, an activity. An ac he was also very fond of teaching, a very good teacher. And he said that we should have a teaching activity which is unique to our department which should, we should keep doing every year. So it was his concept and actually the first SG week was a week. What we uh, did that we invited I think about 15 or 20 people only selected. They would, they came and stayed in the department for a week and every day there would be a visiting faculty who would operate, who would take lectures, there will be round. So the routine activity is going on and these 15 or 20 observers came and spent. But then we realized that it is difficult to go on for any activity for a week. It is difficult for people to come for a week. And uh, so the name continued, but it then shortened to about three days. And uh, the same thing I started in Jaipur uh, as the Jaipur Surgical Festival. So how did uh, your interest come into bile duct injuries and uh, later carcinoma gallbladder? First, by, first call better cancer actually because it started in Ames. Uh, I distinctly remember Dr. Blumgart was to come to Ames uh, as a, a visiting uh, faculty. I think he went to Bombay also at the same time. And I was uh, one of the ad hoc uh, faculty members. So we had a departmental meeting uh, where all the senior faculty members, they were all my teachers, uh, were discussing what to present to Dr. Blumgart. So various options were considered and I was just keeping quiet and listening and I gathered courage and said that why don't we show him uh, which he may not be seeing. So there were two options. One was abdominal tuberculosis which I had developed an interest during my residency only and in fact uh, uh, with Dr. Sharma, my uh, uh, mentor, we uh, as a resident uh, we had authored a leading article in the British Journal of Surgery on abdominal tuberculosis and uh, that time uh, the BGS paid us uh, a check of 100 pounds which he was very gracious to say, nay, 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 you take this, this belongs to you. So it was a big sum of money. So, uh, but abdominal tuberculosis was not the area of uh, work or interest for Dr. Blumgart. And the other thing which by that time I had somehow noticed that is common in our patients which I did not read in the western literature was gallbladder cancer. So I suggested uh, this and uh, somehow the teachers were again gracious enough to accept it and me and Dr. Arvin, we were uh, together as ad hoc faculty members, we were given the responsibility of taking out the data of the entire department for the last five years and analyze it and then Dr. Chattopadhyay presented it to, uh, when Dr. Blumgart came and that was published. Uh, very dismal picture because nothing could be done for these patients uh, and, and uh, somehow that probably, most probably is the only publication which carries the names of consultants of all the four units of AIMS, otherwise there were unit wise publications and uh, so that was my first brush with gallbladder. Now then when I moved to uh, SGPGI, um, that time the services were very skeletal, the institute was still coming up. We were operating from a uh, building which was initially a PHC which had become the general hospital of SGPGI and we had a very primitive kind of a theatre. But in the first few months I realized or maybe even the first few weeks that the number of patients with gallbladder cancer which are coming to SGPGI which was 20 kilometer away from city and which was a government hospital but paying hospital, patient had to pay to even get registered was much more than what I was seeing in AIMS. So uh, uh, our first batch res uh, senior resident was Dr. Sandeep Avasti. I told Sandeep, Sandeep look, 
this is going to be an area of interest to us why don't you start keeping track of these patients from day one so we have records of all patients which came to scpgi opd from day one and then we reached a stage when we realized or uh, it have uh, it occurred to us that it is impossible so many patients are coming so then at uh, after i think a few years we said no not all patients coming to opd all admitted patients then that also became too heavy so then all operated patients so that is how the story of gallbladder and then a generation of residents i remember after sandeep it was probably rebala pradeep when he came to us uh, to do mch then hari bhakti and many others uh, biju much later they all kept this data and this is a prospective database computerized uh, uh, pradeep even at that time was very uh, kind of uh, computer friendly so he created the software and that is uh, still continuing bile duct injury came little later because then uh, we had a very strong medical gastroenterology dr nayak dr gaur choudhary dr vivek saraswat uh, they were the backbone so uh, patients probably came to them first and then came to us and again i realized that because gallstones are so common so many cholecystectomies are being done around us and bile duct injuries get trickled to scpgi uh, unfortunately we had probably world's one of the largest single institution experience with bile duct injury and uh, that's how it became and also i i still feel uh, bad and sad about these patients because actually they are not patients they are young women and men who had a small problem underwent a so called small procedure and now their life has become uh, so complicated so difficult financially also it's a huge burden as compared to the cost of a cholecystectomy many people die because of bile duct injury many must be dying even after we have repaired them because of an astomatic failure and complications so there is a little bit of emotion also involved in bile duct injury i feel and that is why along with dr sadek sikora dr ibrarulla and now vishal gupta who is in aims bopal uh, i have been pushing the the uh, culture and philosophy of uh, safe cholecystectomy now uh, i remember in 93 96 when i was under dr nandi he was very much against laparoscopic surgery uh, not because of bile duct injury i ha- i always felt that you know there's a technology he can't adapt to himself were you in the same boat no not really although for gallbladder cancer yes till dr anil agrawal and dr h s han from korea have now proven that results are as good i was not a uh, Uh, proponent of laparoscopic extended cholecystectomy for gallbladder cancer but we'll leave that topic aside so for cholecystectomy uh, initially i thought yes um, but after seeing these bile duct injuries and i remember that when we were residents there were hardly any articles on bile duct injury in any surgical journal and now you pick up any surgical journal or hpb journal you would find an article Of definitely number of cholecystectomies has increased but not to that extent i think the increase is about 20 to 25% after lap coli came so if you ask me in a as a non scientific uh, person uh, i would still go for a safe procedure even if it is at the cost of an incision uh, or uh, hospital stay or return to work rather than Uh, a procedure which has now been shown inherently is associated with high risk because even after 30 40 years of being there in the uh, scenario the incidence is not going down even in programs where lap cholecystectomy is a part of training the uh, incidence is not going down and the incidence which is reported is definitely an under reporting the actual incidence is much more so i don't know whether for the society as a whole for the entire population of gallstone disease as a whole it is a useful procedure for an individual patient yes where it is successful but if you take the entire cohort into account it probably has caused more uh, morbidity mortality misery more uh, interventions investigations and uh, surgery required as compared to what used to happen during the open coli era so that's uh, more on a philosophical but there's a very big statement uh, coming from you 
and uh, as you know there has been no randomized trial lab coli has creeped into surgical practice without evidence now today it probably would be i won't say unethical but it would be very difficult to control a randomized control trial uh, to show uh, probably open coli will do worse because nobody knows how yeah. to do an open coli i was about to ask that because <laughs> people do not know to do yes. open coli so, they may do lab coli and create yes. injuries but they do not know to do lab to coli between the two there's no comparison actually yeah. there's no alternative because what i feel if you take the denominator of the number of cholecystectomies in any country which is being done and even if the increase in bile duct injury rate is by 0.2% the actual number is very high so i am not sure but it is it is here to stay now we are of course having robotic uh, uh, sir if i may ask you you had some uncomfortable time in sanjay gandhi i mean we as students we always used to here there is a tussle about the hod issue <laughs> and uh, that made uh, dr uh, uh, kapoor very unhappy is that true not unhappy see uh, th these are what i call professional hazards if you are in government service you will face these problems uh, if you are in practice you will have problems that the more patients are going to him and less are coming to me so these are pro i i won't say it made me unhappy it uh, took lot of my time Uh, to try to get that issue solved uh, initially it was important when i was in the middle rung of the career uh, but later it did not make much difference because i don't think position makes uh, too much of a difference except that uh, you may not get invitation to be an examiner or whatever uh, but uh, since you have asked uh, uh, not many students of mine <laughs> except one or two can afford to ask me that but uh, i i have to give full credit to uh, my other colleague also that uh, both of us and i give this very magnanimous 51% credit to him that we never allowed this to trickle down to the faculty or to the residents so i don't think so it didn't affect patient no, care no no not not patient care not teaching and education which unfortunately happened i won't name in some other institutions so that i give full credit the continued so it happen. was between us it had nothing to do with the department it had nothing to do with residents it had nothing to do with anything and it's it's part of the game but does it mean to say that you retired a happy man from sanjay oh yes not not happy even more than happy i think that institute that department has given me everything no you become very emotional very quickly <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first thing you got emotional is when I, you, you talked about parents and now about this uh, uh, this career move in between you went abroad several several times as uh, as a sabbatical yeah so uh, another good thing about scpgi was that it was very liberal in uh, terms of uh, fellowships and scholarships so uh, my first uh, was um, let me yeah so first was again uh, which is uh, which was being handled by dr nandi the pn berry scholarship so i was selected for that but at the same time me and my medical colleague dr chaudhary gaur chaudhary we got a 3 month dad dad is german academic exchange service fellowship and that was to be done in that year so i requested dr nandi that can i postpone my pn berry and he was again very gracious and magnanimous to allow me that so my first visit abroad was for 3 months and it so happens that it was for transplant which did not become my area of interest later because the transplant was the new thing at that time so i went to heidelberg and hanover dr picklemeyer was there and dr harfath was in uh, uh, heidelberg 3 months and then uh, pn berry i went to uk spent time with prof norman williams and i used to visit prof nicols also in uh, st marks and he was operating in private for pouch because that is what was very fascinating at that time dr nandi i think used to do pouches 
so that was the second. Then third was uh, in 93 when I went to Dr. David Skinner on a UICC fellowship for esophagus. These were areas which we had inherited from Dr. Nandi, Dr. Chattopadhyay. <laughs> And uh, then of course, 96, I got a one-year Commonwealth Fellowship, uh, which I spent with uh, Prof. Benjamin at King's. And he only suggested to me that surgery is okay, but since gallbladder is so common in India, you should learn little bit of epidemiology also. So, he arranged for me to visit the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Epidemiology Unit on some days. And uh, that uh, probably laid the foundation of my trying to look into the problem of uh, gallbladder cancer. So, these were uh, a few uh, initial uh, long and then uh, 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 later in my career after I had become a professor, I got a Fulbright fellowship which was mainly a teaching fellowship. So, I visited almost 20-25 institutions in the US delivering talks and teaching uh, students for 4 months. But SCPI again uh, was very liberal and uh, we had the perk of uh, fully funded international conferences initially once in three years, then once in two years and when I became senior every year. So, that gave and, and that was responsible for establishing so many international contacts. Uh, uh, so, the, the database that we had, the publications which came out of these databases and they were all done by the residents. Most of the publications from SGPGI first author is a resident, most publications, very few. Um, at the end of the career, I must say I became very selfish <laughs> when I devised this uh, procedure of anticipatory extended. I said, no, 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 I would not allow any resident to be the first author. This procedure, if it has to go after me, it has to go by my name. So, I will be the first author. But otherwise, most publications from SGPGI and even in the very beginning, I remember uh, Rabala Pradeep had a first author publication in cancer on gallbladder cancer. And Almost every resident has at least one. Biju had so many as first author when he was there. Now, uh, you are much into writing books, but then the difference between you and others are writing books is you give the chapters free, you advertise, uh, you know, this not for any name or fame, but that is your habit. Uh, but I haven't seen with any other author anywhere in the world say, will say, okay, this is my book, <laughs> if you want a chapter, write to me. What is that? What What is that? Is it a Gandhian uh, philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I have always been fascinated by books. In fact, I remember now that as a child also, um, anything which is lying, whether it is for child, for adult, I, I remember my mother used to read novels. She would get novels on rent. So, we would go and get it for her, she would finish it and then we would go and return. So, even if we are not allowed to read that, some if it is lying in front of me, I will pick it up and read. Film me, my, uh, my grandfather was a Bollywood buff, so he would read a, a weekly newspaper called Screen. Hmm. It used to be a film uh, newspaper and I, it was my duty every Friday, I have to go and get it from him, so I would read that. So, it has been my habit, even a pamphlet. If I buy some snack in a and it comes in a, a part of the newspaper uh, uh, paper, so once I have finished the snack, I will read what it is and sometimes it has benefited also uh, because uh, one scholarship notice I got from a paper like this. So, I have been and um, I was always fascinated by Bailey and Love and as a resident, I had four images contributed to Bailey and Love which probably are still there going by my name. So. Uh, I think my first uh, uh, venture into book was that uh, at Ames, I was uh, as an ad hoc faculty member, I was given charge of the emergency department and my medical and orthopedics colleague and uh, yeah, three of us. So, we were all designated as emergency medical officers and we organized a small symposium on polytrauma. So, I decided that whatever the proceedings we will record and it was published as a 20 or 50 page small booklet. So, then it went on. Now, giving this free, see initially when I wrote my first commercial book, it was published by a publisher and I thought I will get a huge amount as a royalty, but the check which came <laughs> very small amount. So, I said what is this? I mean, I put in so much of effort, either I get money or I get name, money is too small. 
So why don't I go for name? So because I am bound to them by contract, the second edition I had to give them, but I never wanted to give it to them. And then I decided that uh, now we have this online option of Kindle, where uh, one that it is easy. Today most of the students wanted to read it on the screen rather than on, on paper. Plus, I can put whatever draft is there and then keep modifying it every three to six months. So except for this book which I am bound to the publisher by contract, which again second edition is going to come out in print uh, now, uh, which will be commercially available and that I cannot give to students uh, because I will be violating the copyright agreement. But uh, rest of the books I have uh, decided that I am, uh, initially I thought I will give the entire book, but then one of my students told me, sir, do not give the entire book because uh, many students would not read it. So now I give the chapter which the students ask. So after every class I announce that those who send me a mail, uh, I keep noting down their addresses and at the end of the week uh, to the group I send the chapter which they want. And uh, recently uh, I am very happy that some students in uh, Nepal and recently I realized in Africa, they have become very fond of these uh, chapters. So I am very happy uh, because uh, I do not need the money now. At that time I needed, so I went for commercial publishing. Now I do not need the money. So uh, what I need and what I want is the name which is much easier uh, to come if I make it a non-commercial and give it like a, a gift and as I said, it is it's basically returning what I have got uh, from the profession. Now what made you choose Jaipur of all the places? Yes. That is uh, you are neither born there yeah. nor you have any roots there. Yeah. So that's Has he got also, any spiritual. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. That's also a story. So uh, when I was, uh, about, um, I had not finished. I was about to finish my term, 65 in uh, SCPGI. So I was very clear in my mind that I am not going to a corporate hospital for two reasons. Because I thought I am a misfit there. I wouldn't like them. They wouldn't like me. And the only thing which corporate gives is money, which I don't need now. Uh, both my sons are well settled. Uh, and uh, we, both me and my wife, we live a very frugal lifestyle. The only expenses involved are our traveling. We are very fond of traveling. Uh, rest, everything is very little. So I keep telling her that you don't even spend the pension which I am getting. What about the savings which we have got? Uh, and this habit of saving, uh, even as a student, when I used to get scholarship, I would save some amount from that. So uh, I've saved. Uh, reasonable uh, amount of money and in between, uh, maybe you do not know, I went on sabbatical to UAE for 2 years. This was in 2010. So uh, that was purely for money because I thought that will give me a financial stability. Also probably um, at the back of my mind was that I wanted to escape from the uh, stress of this uh, ongoing uh, tussle. Uh, plus, I wanted a relaxed kind of life and that is where I wrote the first book, Pearls in Surgery, because uh, workload was not much there. So after that, financially, I have been very comfortable. Uh, so I was looking for a teaching institution. AIMS, the new AIMS was an option, but unfortunately, they would give me a contract for one year and renew it every one year till 70, which I was not very comfortable. So one of my senior colleagues uh, in AIMS, uh, he was my senior resident when I was doing MS, Dr. M. C. Mishra, who then went on to become the director of AIMS also. After his retirement from AIMS, he had joined this Mahatma Gandhi Medical College as vice chancellor. So he is like an elder brother to me, so he would, and he is the one who sent me to UAE also. So um, he once called me, ki, Vinay, what is your plan after you finish, when are you finishing? I said, sir, I am looking for a teaching institution where I can teach, uh, give more time to teaching, writing. Uh, so he said, why don't you come and visit this place? I was not very sure uh, because general impression of private medical colleges in North India is that they are not of a very good standard. South, fortunately, you have some very good institutions. They are even better than government institutions, but North, unfortunately, it is not uh, very good and I was not very comfortable because there were so many private colleges in UP itself, but I was not very happy. So I said, Chalo, uh, Dr. Mishra, he is like an elder brother to me, he is calling me, I cannot say no to him 
and anyway they are paying for my visit uh, jaipur ghum ke aa jate hain we'll go and have fun so i said my wife will also come because she wants to see so we both came and uh, we were impressed and the uh, the this uh, hospital again i have to mention names is owned by um, father and son duo both doctors dr ml swankar he is uh, md gaini from pgi chandigarh he is contemporary of dr adarsh choudhury and very good friend of dr adarsh choudhury uh, he did lot of work in ivf he is one of the pioneers of ivf in the country and his son is a surgeon as well as a gynecologist the kind of uh, reception uh, we got the kind of hospitality and courtesy and respect so that was the deciding factor in fact as soon as i came back i gave a notice that i want premature uh, voluntary retirement and please relieve me i am joining and i had decided 1st october 2nd october gandhi jayanti i am going to join mahatma gandhi medical college but the government in its wisdom said no you are indispensable <laughs> i don't think i am indispensable <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, so you can't fight the government and then covid came and obviously there was no question of asking again so as soon as the covid second phase uh, no i think first phase was over i moved my application again and i must say this the only time i used political Uh, uh, pressure and contacts through my friends not to get the appointment but, but to get relieved <laughs> from an institution i even met the highest officers in the government mm -hmm. in the state and requested them that please relieve <laughs> me and fortunately it worked and uh, i got relieved and i joined and uh, as i said now i look towards this new institution as my tapobhumi the place of my devotion and uh, fortunately two of my students ajay sharma he was the uh, professor of surgical gastroenterology and piyush vashne he was there he's recently moved to aims jodhpur they were there so it was as if i am moving from one unit of the department to another unit and uh, um, i said to them exactly what dr kaushik told us when he came to us i said i have done enough you people continue to do what you are doing i am here to support you and to help you and to guide you whenever you need me and uh, that's how it happened and then of course uh, uh, i joined in surgical gastroenterology uh, but then the institute decided that we need to the new institute uh, that we need to have an hpb also and uh, that's how and recently uh, because of probably because of my interest in teaching and uh, education Uh, the uh, university has uh, given me the additional responsibility of being the uh, pro vice chancellor where i have to look after all the seven colleges under the university which includes dental nursing physiotherapy hospital administration and others so more and more time i am now uh, spending on teaching uh, online teaching writing and helping my younger colleagues to grow and develop and uh, achieve even more than what i have done so far but your enthusiasm seems to increase multifold after joining j yeah because i am very comfortable i i have no primary uh, patient responsibility because all patients are admitted under my colleagues they are primarily responsible so it gives me little uh, uh, freedom from the uh, pressure because i am sure you also fee know that the moment you have one complication uh, next few days uh, you are very mm. kind of stressed so i wanted to be free from that stress i said no no you you are young people you are more energetic people you take the primary responsibility of the patient i am there to help and guide you so i am now playing uh, i am going to probably deliver a talk on this one of these days the playing the role of a surgical coach so i have ha i have been a uh, Uh, player waiting in the wings then i was in aims on an ad hoc position then in scpgi initially i was a player so i scored runs and centuries also probably then i became the captain also now i am the coach so my job is to help the players do better than what they are doing and to make sure that the team wins what are your hobbies what do you do in the after hours are you a poet you uh, read you write uh, other than medicine 
<laughs> prayers no i am i'm in that sense i am not a religious person so on my own i probably would uh, not and i i have to tell you an anecdote so dr ibrarullah he is our uh, initial almost uh, first or second batch uh, student he was posted in tirupati and he once invited me to tirupati and uh, he knew that tirupati is a very uh, kind of sought after uh, pilgrimage uh, for people and uh, although he belongs to a different religion but he thought about it and he arranged a special darshan for me and he asked me sir would you like to go i said no no so when i came back i came back via delhi so that time my mother was alive so she knew that i have gone to tirupati and she would ask so i told ibrar that please get me a uh, this thing the picture. picture so that i can give it to my mother i didn't tell a lie i didn't tell her that i didn't go to tirupati but i gave her that picture and she thought that i might must have gone so i'm not a very religious person but of course when she would do a puja and ask me to sit i will sit there it's not that i'm against religion but i'm against religion in public life that is my opinion and i keep telling my wife that if i ever become the head of the state the first rule i will pass is that religion has to remain within the walls of the home so anyway uh, hobbies uh, uh, earlier i used to read a lot uh, i when i was in aims uh, we uh, some of us we would always go to the book fair buy some books i used to read hindi also uh, but then gradually i went into writing so writing is my hobby when you write anything uh-huh. is it in print so i uh, i still have these pieces of paper so whatever comes to my mind i scribble i am still not used to uh, phone uh, and then uh, i will transfer this to my master file uh, mainly writing is mainly uh, surgery but uh, i have written a small uh, quiz book on uh, mahatma gandhi uh, which is different from other quiz books that it not only asks and answers questions it narrates anecdotes and interesting facts related to that question so it makes it an interesting reading the purpose of writing that was to uh, i thought i'll give it uh, for free to indians who have been living abroad for a long time who lost probably contact and especially their children who are born and brought up there and lot of indophiles so a lot of our surgical colleagues when they come to know about this they ask for a copy and i give it to them and they have uh, liked it then the so this was published first edition now i'm working on the second edition uh, little revised then i have written a quiz book on india again basically to highlight the historical journey of the country so far which uh, is again now everything is in soft copy form so it is a, also on kindle again and uh, although i am not a religious person but i think ramayan is a good uh, read it has lot of messages so i have done a small quiz book on uh, ramayan also and uh, i think it's little early but uh, the manuscript draft manuscript is there of my journey uh, now that will be much sought after in <laughs> uh, the title so far is uh, because that is what uh, actually has happened uh, i i think i can disclose it uh, now since i am in conversation with you around the world on gall bladder okay so it it talks about how uh, i have uh, established contacts both academic and personal and how travel has become a hobby for me as well as my wife uh, so we are very fond of travel we have a bucket list covid unfortunately uh, created problem we couldn't go to so many places but we've started traveling again some and, uh, sensitive questions have been a good husband <laughs> uh, as i said that see uh, we were uh, i'm sure you also passed through the same thing and many of other our colleagues of our generation uh, we probably gave or wanted to give so much time to our profession first patients and students and career that all of us have ignored uh, you feel bad about parents but i think we all have ignored our families also 
um, I am sure there were stages when uh, I probably, unfortunately, because uh, my wife Lily, uh, she was not uh, in um, active uh, employment. She worked whenever she wanted to. Uh, so, she gave all the time to the kids, to the family, to social uh, contacts uh, and that is how it has been a balance. So, I, I do not think any one of us uh, have been a good uh, child of our parents or a good uh, husband to our or spouse to our spouses or good uh, father or mother to our children because uh, we definitely kept them at number two. Uh, after our uh, profession. So, are you happy with what has happened with your life? Uh, how many marks do you give yourself out of 10 for your journey till now? 10.1. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could not have been better than this. On that it note, sir, it is so this. wonderful talking to you. Sorry, I would have asked some difficult questions, but you know, it is so, so. Uh, informative and so inspirational. I hope it will help a lot of youngsters. It may be the point said that you may need to concentrate on your parents and children if you can while balancing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Pata. Thank you. Thank you.